I had planned what I was going to do this morning for the sermon back on Tuesday, and then literally all hell broke loose. Um, but I don't think it's going to change much. So I, I have a little, I have a little thing here. <laughs> Has anybody heard about this? Right? There's, there's a few people here that know, and there's a few people that have absolutely no clue why I'm standing up here with a red Starbucks cup. Right? It's, it's because that Starbucks is now the Antichrist, and that they're trying to take Christ out of Christmas, because it's a red cup, and it doesn't have any snowflakes or any snowman or anything on it. It's just a red cup. And how dare Starbucks remove Christmas from their cup? Excuse me, when, when do snowflakes and snowmen... I'm going to sit that right there so that we can see it the whole time. When do snowflakes and snowman and whatever else was on that cup before have to do with Christmas? They don't have anything to do with Christmas. And I have lots of friends on Facebook on both sides of the spectrum, right? Believe it or not, I have very liberal friends on Facebook and I have very conservative friends on Facebook. And there's Christians who are fighting over this stupid cup. Because Starbucks is taking Christ out of Christmas. I'm personally more concerned about what's in here <laughs> than what's on the outside of this cup. Because this doesn't mean anything. Right? Actually, if we wanted to, to wage a war on Starbucks for Christmas, we should tell them they should have a blue cup. Why? Thank you, Ruthie. There's, this little, there's these two little things that come before Christmas. You see, we made it through Halloween, and now we're all on Christmas, right? And because that's where the world is at. But there's these two things that come before Christmas. One is Thanksgiving, and the other is Advent, right? All of which you will learn very quickly in December if you haven't been here before, because I don't let them sing Christmas hymns during Advent. Because we're waiting. But that's what the, we hear this morning, right? Mark tells us that they came out of the temple and the, one of the disciples asked Jesus, look at all of these beautiful stones and all of these beautiful buildings. And then Jesus asked them, do you see these beautiful stones and these beautiful buildings? Jesus, where you're not just listening, he just said, look at all of these beautiful stones and these beautiful buildings. But not one of these is going to be left, right? There's going to be wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famine. And there's going to be wars. How many? 158 was the last count I heard. Died in Paris. You haven't heard about that. Bombings and gunning. And here's the next war that now the, the, the liberals and the conservative Christians are waging on Facebook is, why are we praying for Paris when we're not praying for Beirut? Does anybody know what happened in Beirut? Or how about Baghdad? All of this happened in the last five days. All over the country, people are dying. And why do we focus on just one? And not all of them. In Kuwait in April, there was hundred some... Don't quote me on that one. A hundred some students killed at a university in Kuwait in April. That didn't make the news. But all these bad things are happening all over the world. And last night, I listened to the stories of a man who was the youth director in our Senate whose son was born with a debilitating disease and he was only supposed to live 13 months after they got the, the diagnosis. His son is now five. They got the diagnosis about two years ago, three years ago. So he's beat the odds. But still, why does that happen? We take our time to look at things and we wonder about where the world is going and we read passages this morning that tell us that the end of the world is coming. And you know what? There's a lot of stuff in the Bible that talks about the end of the world. There's a lot of stuff in the Bible that says a lot of bad things are going to happen. And it's going to happen to a lot of really good people. 
So does that mean we should all build bomb shelters and stay in them and never come out? Thank you, Ms. Lambert. I'm not looking out here. I'm just looking over here, and she's shaking her head. Probably because she doesn't want to be locked up that much with Bruce. But <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really mean that, Bruce. I just had to. Lie. We were getting really deep there for a moment, so I had to lighten the mood here a bit. So the passages in the Bible are not meant to make us be afraid and run away and to be looking for things so that we can say, oh, look, the end of the world is coming. Because you know what? If you read the Bible through and believe what it says, Jesus himself said he didn't know when it was going to happen. So if Jesus doesn't know when it's going to happen, how do we think we can figure out enough, written in this book, to figure out when the end of the world is going to come? We can't. And it's not about us arguing over a stupid cup or arguing about who in the world we're praying for or who in the world we're not praying for. It's about us being who God called us to be and stepping out in courage and in faith knowing that what God wrote on our hearts is permanent. And do the things that we need to do to support and continue to grow the faith in everyone else. Because that's the last line in Hebrews. I'm going to read that again. Out of Hebrews. And this is a sermon. Hebrews is a sermon. A very long sermon. So if anyone thinks that I do long sermons, read the book of Hebrews. It's much longer. Wait, it's a home game. We've got to hurry up. <laughs> he says at the end of Hebrews. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So, if anybody ever says to you that I can be a Christian on my own, and I don't need to go to church, right there's your answer. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Not neglecting to meet together. We need to gather together as a body. And what do we need to do when we need to gather together as a body? We need to provoke each other. That's what Hebrew says. What do you think when I say provoke each other? What does that bring up in your mind? It brings up in your mind what happened. I mean, this morning when I talk things about provoking, it brings up in my mind what happened in Paris. And what happened in... What happened in Beirut? Right? People provoke each other to do bad things. Because that's what happens when we provoke somebody. But provoking doesn't necessarily mean that. Go home later and look up the word provoke. Provoke means to move or to incite. And incite sometimes is a bad word because it's like a riot, right? But Hebrews tells us we need to provoke people to... What does it say? Love. We need to do things that causes others to want to seek out God and to know His love and to show His love to everybody else. We need to do things that will cause people to want to be a part of this gathering, to be a part of the gatherings, to come together, to learn about who God is, to learn how much God loves them, to partake of His meal, and to worship Him with the gathered community. We need to do things that are going to help others and provoke them and move them to do the things that they need to do. Now, do we always do that? I will be the first to say that I don't. We don't always do the things that to help others come to us. We don't always do the right things. But you know what? That's why there's forgiveness. And that's why God came so that we can move out and do things in courage. I bought a new cross. I'm telling my wife. She hasn't seen it yet. I bought a new cross. Actually, it looks like a... <laughs> Thank you. Who said that? It looks like a hashtag. Right? It's my hashtag cross. Um, or it's a sharp. Right? Long before this was a hashtag, it was a sharp, for those of you that know how to read music. Right? 
it's a number sign. But it's a cross. And this is the Mount Carmel, it's called the Mount Carmel Cross. And it's actually four crosses in one. I'll have it up here or out there later so that you can see it. But it's four crosses in one, right? There's a cross here, there's a cross here, a cross here, and a cross here. And they all intersupport each other. And if you take one of them out, the whole thing falls apart. Because we have to be together. Because if we're not, then we can't support each other. And if we're not supporting each other, then we're not provoking each other to acts of love. We're not provoking each other to come and be a part of this community. And it's not always easy. And yes, we're going to let each other down. But we can have faith in Christ to know that the promises that he made are permanent and that he's never going to walk away from us. And then in the tumult, and in the wars, and in the famines, and in the earthquakes, and in everything else, the bad is going to happen around us. He's always still going to be there to support us and carry us and help us move forward. So don't fear what could happen. But have faith in Jesus, knowing that no matter what happens, he's there to support you. And he needs you to be there to support everyone else around you. So go and do what Christ is calling you to do.